John Livingston was the son of the minister of Colsaith. His father was very earnest in being faithful to the word of God and suffered a great deal. Many godly people visited their home and it was very helpful for John to hear them talk about the things of God and to see how they lived and behaved. John's mother was also very godly and humble. Those who are humble are not grand and important in their own eyes. They do not boast in what they can do, but are the opposite of those who are proud about themselves. Those who are truly humble before God have a deep sense of their own sinfulness and unworthiness. This was a very important influence on John as he grew up. The gospel and love for God and his word were so much part of his home life that he could not remember the time or the circumstances of his conversion. He knew that he had a heart and a life that belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ and was trusting only in him. He often prayed with true earnestness and read the Bible with delight. When he was older, he was able to go to the Lord's table for the first time. It was a very great privilege and it meant so much to him. He was so moved by it that his whole body trembled and shook. But then his fears went away and he was able to find comfort and assurance as he engaged in it. Sadly, John's mother died when he was still a teenager. At that time he had difficulty in knowing what he should do. Should he be a doctor? Or was it God's will for him to be a minister like his father? How would God direct him? He had to be clear in his mind. So he went to spend a whole day by himself praying to God and reading the Bible. He found a cave near a river where he could be alone. During that day it became very clear to John that he must preach Jesus Christ and if he didn't he would be disobedient to the Lord. While he was still 16 and at university an important test came. The king and bishops at that time were trying to force everyone to kneel for the Lord's Supper rather than sit at the Lord's table. Faithful ministers knew that the Bible only speaks about sitting at the Lord's table and that kneeling was dangerous because it implied that there was something about the bread and wine that meant they must show reverence for them. Once he was at the Lord's table together with other Christians, including some of his fellow students. The bishop came in and ordered everyone to kneel. John and his friends refused. Kneel or leave, demanded the bishop. John was brave enough to speak. He told the bishop that there was nothing in God's word that commanded them to kneel, and that it was wrong to rob people of the Lord's Supper if they wouldn't kneel. But they had to leave. A while afterwards, John was approved to preach. He wanted to be a minister of a congregation, and many people wanted him as their minister. But the bishops always put a stop to it. The reason was that he would not promise to obey them. It wasn't because he was rebellious, but because the bishops claimed an authority that the Bible doesn't give. No minister is more important or better than any other minister. They cannot order them to do things just because they say so. John would not accept and follow the way that the bishops were changing God's worship. He knew that only God in the Bible can tell us how he wants to be worshipped. It was hard waiting and just going to preach in one place and another. But John had to be every bit as patient and humble as he was firm. One lady wrote him letters to encourage him. She said that all the difficulties that he was experiencing were like him being hammered and chiseled because he needed a lot of shaping to be a living stone in God's temple. Did you notice the clever way she used his surname, Living Stone? God was going to use John in a very amazing way. Perhaps this was why he was keeping him humble in difficult times. At that time, lots of people would gather to the places where communion would be done in a way that honoured the Bible rather than the bishops. One time, lots of godly people went to the Lord's Supper at a place called Shots. 
There were some well-known faithful ministers there who preached at a number of services held over several days. As well as the services, people met together for prayer and spiritual discussion. Some of the meetings even went on all night. John was at one of these meetings on the Lord's Day evening. On the next day, which was Monday, people didn't want to go away. They had experienced so much of God's presence and help that it made them sad to think of leaving. The ministers decided that there should be one last service and that John should be the preacher. John felt terrified. He went off to be alone in the fields to pray to God. What should he do? He felt so unworthy and so afraid of preaching in front of so many people. Perhaps the best thing was just to run away. But John knew he couldn't do this. This was a place where he had preached in the past and found that God helped him more than anywhere else. It would be distrusting God to run away. So he did preach, and God did indeed help him. He preached for an hour and a half from the verse, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. By this time, he really felt that he must end the sermon, and started to say some final words. But then the Lord gave him special pleading words to say to the congregation for a whole hour more. He had never had so much of the help and presence of God in his life. Five hundred men and women, both poor and rich, were converted that day. It was a wonderful and remarkable day of God's grace. John had to preach a week later, but he found that it was very difficult. He didn't seem to have God's help so much this time, so it kept him humble and showed him that what had happened was to do with God and not John himself. He managed to become a minister in the north of Ireland, where he would not have to agree to anything that was wrong. The people there were originally from Scotland, but many of them were not interested in spiritual things. Yet, God blessed the faithful preaching of John Livingston and others, and a great change happened. Many people became very earnest about their souls and were converted. There was a time on the Monday after a communion when John Livingston preached to a very large congregation. Just like at the Kirk of Shots, hundreds of people were either converted or spiritually transformed. But the bishops were not happy with all of this. They wanted rid of the faithful ministers, even though God had blessed their preaching so much. This showed what they were really concerned about. So Livingston and others were told they could no longer be ministers. They wondered what to do now. Some of them felt it would be right to go to America, just like the Pilgrim Fathers who first sailed there not so long before. They thought that they could be free from the control of the king and bishops there. So a ship was built called the Eagle Wing, and they set out with great hopes. But they didn't get that far away from the coast of Ireland before they met with such fierce storms that they had to turn back. Perhaps it was not God's will to go to America after all, they thought. They prayed to be kept safe in the storm. On board the ship, a baby boy was born to parents and John Livingston gave him the unusual name Seaborn. That boy would never forget how he first came into the world. Things seemed to be getting worse in Scotland. The king and bishops were forcing more and more changes on the church. They wanted to change the way the church had worshipped since the Reformation. John was able to help encourage those who were praying that the bishops would not get their way. He could also carry messages to places like London. When the bishops tried to force their Roman Catholic prayer book on the church, people were outraged. Ordinary people were against it, just as much as ministers. In the main church in Edinburgh, one lady called Jenny Geddes was so outraged that she picked up the stool she was sitting on. You'll not say mass in my ear, she said, and flung the stool at the dean who was reading the prayer book. The protests against the prayer book did stop it from going ahead. It led to the signing of the National Covenant throughout the country. 
John Livingston witnessed moving services where people lifted up their hands to swear to the National Covenant. Sometimes there would be more than 1,000 people doing this. The tears were falling from their eyes because they were so full of desire to serve God. It reminded John of the time of the Kirk of Shots when the Holy Spirit's power was so clearly witnessed. John Livingston could now settle down to being a humble preacher in a humble position. God continued to bless his faithful preaching in transforming the lives and hearts of many. He was also given important things to do, like going to meet King Charles II and speaking with him. John didn't like getting involved in these political matters. He preferred to take a low place. He also didn't trust the young king, who seemed as if he was pretending to be interested in spiritual things, but really wasn't. Something else that John did at this time is still helpful for us today. Since he knew the Hebrew language so well, he was able to help with making sure that the Psalms for singing in church were the best possible translation. John's congregation loved him, and they were overcome with sadness when he had to leave. Why was he leaving? It wasn't through his choice or theirs. John had been right about how King Charles II could not be trusted. The king and his government were now forcing the faithful ministers out of the church. John was going to be banished from the country and told he could never return. He had loved preaching and said, If ever my heart was lifted up, it was in preaching Jesus Christ. But he would not be unfaithful in order to continue preaching in that place. Yet God opened the way for him to preach and write in Holland for almost 10 years. During his life he had experienced some wonderful things, but God kept him humble through it all. Perhaps you think a lot about yourself. You may be tempted to always want people to think how good you are. You don't like being told that you're wrong, perhaps especially when the Bible points out these things. You want to get attention from others, but you aren't so ready to think about the needs of other people yourself. All this is pride. It may seem natural and good to you, but it is a dangerous sin. It blinds us to spiritual realities and refuses to obey God and submit to Him. The Bible tells us that pride is a sin that God especially hates and that we must humble ourselves before Him. Being humble is an attractive thing. When we humble ourselves before God in faith, it greatly honours Him. It also helps us in this life when we go through difficulties. John Livingston said that being humble is like a tree that has very strong roots and can stand against all kinds of wind that would blow it over. We need to learn what it is to be humble before God for this life and in view of the life to come. The Bible says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honour shall uphold the humble in spirit.